Hello everybody, my name is Yuri, and today I'm supposed to teach you some statistics. About my background, I studied veterinary science, but I never worked as a vet, and I did not study statistics, but always work with data. That's why I'm here. So I have a good and a bad news for you. The bad news is, statistics is boring, and it's really hard to understand. Otherwise, you would already know it. So I will most likely not succeed to teach you statistics. But the good news is, you don't need to completely understand it. You just need to know how to use statistics to get the most out of your data. Think about driving a car for a moment. I personally have no idea about how my car works. I can barely change the tire, but I know how to drive. And that's what counts. And if I see traffic light, for example, I brake, if I see somebody else driving like crazy, I horn and scream. Similarly, when you see your data, you just have to recognize some patterns, like traffic lights, and know what to do about them. That's pretty much it. So, what I'll try you to teach is not the dry statistics, but data science. It's more pragmatic and down to the earth. Data science uses statistics as a tool to get to, to the goal, be it a thesis or publication. Similarly, like we use the car to get to our destination. Um, but data science does not require you to become an expert in statistics. So, in this first lecture, we'll have a look at a simple table of a maximum 10 observations with some basic data patterns and figure out what can we do about them. Okay, let's start with the smallest possible example. What do we see here? We see one column of data with two different things in it. Since it is not one thing, but two, the data vary from yes to no. This is why every column in your Excel sheet is called variable. So let's call it a variable. And your column can have thousands of rows, but we still have only two words in it, yes and no. These two things in the column is very common. It can be zero and one, control of treatment, failure or success. And these two things are two categories of your variable. That is why variable one is called categorical variable. It's also often called binomial variable because there are only two things. It's a useful term, binomial, but I don't like statistical jargon because, for example, you cannot extend it. There is no such thing as a trinomial or tetranomial variable. So don't be confused by these statistical terms. Just continue learning. Now, since we have categorical variables, the only question is, what can we do with them? And um, the only answer is we can count them, nothing more. And are these counts useful? Well, yes, if we count our huge table, we have seven no's and three yeses. It already gives us some information. But what can we do with these counts? Well, we can get proportions or probabilities from them. It sounds fancy, but probabilities are actually just counts. And imagine an example, we ask 10 farmers whether they like sustainable agriculture or not. And only three of them said yes, and seven said no. So it couldn't be simpler as that. 30% of our, of our farmers support sustainable agriculture and 70% doesn't. And the last question is, are these proportions real? Can we trust our dat data we collected? And to answer this question, we have to compare this data to some reality, to some truth, to something we know. Or if we don't know anything, we have to compare it to something we expect. And compare is actually a key word here. And this is what statistics does. It just compares things. In order to understand how this comparison works, we have to understand hypotheses. Think about Monday. 
you know that nothing exciting is going to happen. You go to work, you get home, you watch some Netflix, done. It's not bad, but it's zero exciting or null exciting. And that is our null hypothesis, where nothing new happened. Now, think about Saturday. Compared to Monday, something exciting might actually happen. You meet a friend, you go for a hike, you go out. And this is a nice alternative to a boring Monday. And that is our alternative hypothesis. And only by comparing Monday to Saturday, you know that your Saturday is different and you experience something new. The same is with data. If you already know something, it's your null hypothesis. If you don't expect anything to happen, it's your null hypothesis. If you compare things, no difference is your null hypothesis. When you collect some new data, you expect nothing new, which is your null hypothesis. But you hope that your new data shows something new. And that is your alternative hypothesis. And only comparison between things can tell you whether you found something new or different. Okay, let's compare our Monday and Saturday. The probability that Tuesday will be similar to Monday is very high. And the probability that Saturday will be similar to Monday is very low. This probability is a p-value. Thus, p-value is simply a measure of similarity between things. High p-value means things are similar. Low p-value means things are different. When are things significantly different? Um, well, below or above 5% of similarity. This threshold was chosen by Ronald Fisher, arbitrarily, doesn't have any scientific background, but it's stuck in science and we use it all the time. And that means that when the similarity of your days is below 5%, your days are significantly different. And when the similarity of your days is above 5%, your days are similar. So let's conduct our first statistical test. In this test, we compare our data we collected to what we know or expect to be true. What we expect is that the half of the farmers will say that they support sustainable agriculture and the half wouldn't. And this is our now hypothesis. What we observed or the data we collected is that only 30% of farmers support sustainable agriculture. So how exactly can we compare two things in our binomial variable? I'm glad you asked, because there was a test for it. It's the exact binomial test. So this test shows us that we asked 10 farmers what they think, and only three of them said yes, they support sustainable agriculture. And despite the fact that Three, three and seven are far apart from each other, or 30% is really far from 70%. It's not what we compare. What we compare is 30% to 50, which is a null hypothesis, and 70% to 50. And now you can see that the difference is not that high. And now I hope you can understand that the p-value is really huge, which, again, shows the similarity between things. Namely, it shows that uh, we have no difference in our data from the null hypothesis. So we found nothing new. Another interesting test which can do the same thing is a Pearson chi-square goodness of fit test. It's a fancy name, but it actually does the same thing. It takes our data, three and seven, and compares it to the expected data, five and five. And you might ask, why do we need actually two things doing the same job. Well, um, binomial, exact binomial test is really cool, but it has a problem and can only work with two categories. As soon as we have more than two categories, it's not binomial anymore, so we cannot use this test. And that is why we need a chi-square test. 
Moreover, these chi-square tests can be used between two different categorical variables. And that's why I'm presenting it here. You will see this test a lot. So remember chi-square test. And here's the example with two different categorical variables. In variable one, we have yes and no. We already counted it. And imagine a different variable with three different categories, low, middle, and high. So the chi-square test can actually check the association between two categorical variables, which can have two or more categories. And what we do with this test actually is not different than with the exact binomial test. We only count the categories and then compare the alternative hypothesis, which says there is an association between these variables, to the zero hypothesis or null hypothesis, which says that there is no association between these two categorical variables. And looking at the p-value of the uh, chi-square test, you can see that there is no association between these variables. And um, if you look at the numbers, you can see that it's actually not enough data to say that anything is connected to anything. And here is a small summary for our categorical data. Remember that statistics just compares things. Else remember that probabilities are just counts. Doesn't matter how fancy it sounds, all these tests, all we did until now is counted. And everyone who's listening to this lecture can count. So in the beginning of the lecture, we talked about uh, data and some patterns. And summarizing what we learned until now, if you see one column with categorical data, use the exact binomial test for two categories or goodness of fit or chi-square goodness of fit test for two or more categories. If you see two columns with categorical data, simply use chi-square association test. And if you see column with numbers, just go to the next slide and we'll cover it. Well, in the first variable, we had just two different things, yes and no. In the second variable, we have three different things, low, middle, and high. And in the third variable, our numerical data, we have 10 different things. Is it more complicated? Well, not really. It's even easier than the categorical variables because we can express all of these numbers in one single number, mean or median. And this is how it goes. Let's imagine then variable three measures the IQ of farmers, which were asked about the sustainable agriculture. And we can see then on average, the farmers who said yes to sustainable agriculture have a higher IQ. It makes kind of sense because um, why would you say no to sustainable agriculture? It's sustainable. But I was sure about our average. Can we judge two groups or compare two groups and the, their smartness uh, just with two numbers? Well, no. We need some kind of measure of uncertainty for it. That's why we have a confidence intervals. Um, the more data we have, the more certain are we about our mean and the smaller confidence intervals are. And the less data we have, the less certain are we about our mean and the wider the confidence intervals are. So my initial, initial impression that farmers who said yes to uh, sustainable agriculture are smarter is actually not true. And that's how you know it. It's a little trick I uh, always apply uh, for comparing groups. If the confidence and intervals overlap, like in our example, there is most likely no statistically, um, statistical difference between the groups. Only tests can show, so we still need to, to do a test. But uh, usually it's the case. And if the confidence interval, uh, intervals don't overlap, there might be a statistical difference. But again, only tests can tell. 
So summarizing this small um, group comparison, we can say that numerical data can be uh, really conveniently expressed in one single number, mean or median. This number is the best estimation of true reality and true presentation of the group or the variable. We still need some kind of uncertainty uh, about this number or measure of uns uncertainty about this number. And usually it is confidence intervals or standard deviation or standard error. More data means more confidence and smaller intervals, which is always good. And all the tests do, they just compare means and their confidence intervals with each other. How do they do this? How do they decide? How do they decide whether we compare mean or median? Well, it depends on the uh, two things, normality of the data and similarity of variances. If you don't really understand them now, it's okay, you don't have to. I only show one picture before we go to the uh, comparison of groups. And this picture is about the normality of the data. You see that this data set is normally di distributed or bell-shaped. Um, it is normally distributed because we can take the mean as the best representative for, the, for this data set. This is here, because the most of the data is here. However, if the data set is not normally distributed uh, like this one, the mean would not represent the reality really well, because the most of the data is here, not where the mean is. That's why we need a median to compare to groups if the data is not normally distributed. And here is our first uh, statistical test for numerical data. It might look complicated, but it's actually not. You already know everything about this plot and all the statistics. First of all, we have two categories which we compare. Um, the farmers who said no to sustainable agriculture, and the farmers who said yes to it. We also have numbers, only three farmers wanted to do sustainable agriculture, and seven farmers didn't. We also have the um, IQ measurements. These are the small points on this uh, plot. And we have a um, measure of central tendency, the mean in this case, and the median, this horizontal black line. So what the test does, it checks two assumptions, whether the data is normally distributed and whether the variances uh, of two groups differ. Um, if the data is normally distributed, it um, uses a, or you use a simple uh, student t-test when the variances are equal. In our case, we see that these data vary not too much, and this data vary a lot. That's why we need another t-test. It calls uh, Welsh t-test. In our case, we took it, which means that our data is normally distributed in both groups, but the variances differ. That's why we use Welsh t-test for this comparison. I also told you that if the confidence intervals uh, overlap, there is most likely no statistical significant, uh, significant difference between these groups. And the p-value can tell us this. We already know that huge p-value, above 5% similarity, means no, stati uh, no statistical difference. And um, this is what we see here. So our conclusion of the first numerical uh, test is that there is no significant difference between the IQ of two groups, farmers who are against sustainable agriculture and farmers who are for sustainable agriculture. The thing is, sometimes you have more than two groups. What do you do? Well, you actually do the same things. You check for normality first. You check for um, homogeneity of variances, whether the variances are similar or not, second. And then you do the test. If the data is normally distributed, you use the ANOVA test. You already heard about this. If the data is not normally distributed, you use a kruskal wallis test. And all these tests do, they just compare different groups.
All right, let's have a small summary for the uh, groups comparison. All we did until now, we just compare groups. It doesn't matter how fancy statistical tests sound, ANOVA, ANOVA model, Kruskal Wallace test. All they do, they just compare groups. And here are our data patterns. For two groups, if the data is symmetric or normally distributed and variances are similar, you use a student's t-test. If the data is normally distributed but variances differ, like in our example, you use a, you use a Welsh t-test. And if the data is not normally distributed, the variance doesn't matter then, you simply use the Wilcoxon test. For over two groups, you use ANOVA when, when the uh, data is normally distributed and Kruskal Wallace when the data is not normally distributed. And this is pretty much it. If both columns are numeric, you just go to the next slide. Let's have a look at two numeric variables, the IQs of farmers and their salaries. Um, do farmers who are smarter earn more? I don't know. A staring at the data cannot answer this question, and the good trick in data science is always to plot it. It can reveal some kind of trend, which is already a relationship between two variables. And here, plotting the data, we can immediately see that farmers which are smarter earn more money. Whether this trend is significant or not, it's um, not important right now. The main thing about correlation is whether the um, variable of our interest, salary in this case, can be predicted by the other variable, IQ. And it actually can. Interesting thing about um, this plot is that we can summarize all these data, 20 observations, in one single number namely the slope of this line. This slope can show us that the trend is positive. So the smarter the farmers get, the more they earn. And the last exciting thing about this plot is that compared to previous methods where we just compared things and didn't produce anything new, here we can produce new data. Simply, we can predict the salary out of the IQ of farmers, even for the areas where we don't have any data. And this production of new data is actually production of new knowledge. And producing new knowledge is the essence of science. Here we see the plot for simple linear regression. And it looks suspiciously similar to the correlation plot. And the only question is, do we need them both? Well, actually not. They both do the same thing. They show the relationship between two numeric variables. Um, the only difference is that the correlation is limited. It's limited to two numeric variables, while regression can handle more than two numeric variables, and moreover, it can handle categorical variables in the same time. Uh, for instance, you can predict a uh, salary of the farmer depending, depending on number of animals it has on the farm. Uh, when, for example, a farmer has a lot of animals on the farm, it earns more than the small farmer. However, a lot of animals bring a lot of problems. That's why the middle farmer has more money. But um, these trends are not significant, you see, because the confidence intervals overlap. Still, we see some trend, and this is already a nice um, inference from our model, some new knowledge. We already know this plot. The smarter the farmer is, the more uh, he earns. But this relationship is not significant because the confidence interval throughout the whole range of the IQ values overlaps. All right. Uh, to summarize the numerical data, you have to uh, think about uh, several patterns. For two numeric variables, you can use correlation. If you have more than two numeric variables, correlation doesn't work. So you use linear regression instead. If you have both 
categorical and numerical var variables use linear regression. And here we come to the beauty of numbers. Um, if you have strange numbers like a lot of high numbers and a lot of low numbers, you can simply transfer them into two categories, high and low. And if you have two categories out of the numeric one, you can start to do a categorical analysis with it. So now we can go to the beginning of the lecture and start with the binomial test, with the chi-square test, etc. But we can even compare two groups. And this is the power of numbers. You can make a categorical variables out of the numeric one. However, if you have more than two variables you want to analyze and your variable of interest is categorical, like zero and one, yes and no, um, you can do logistic regression. So it's also possible to have a um, categorical variable which can handle um, several numeric ones. For example, let's make a categorical variable out of the numeric one. We take a salary of farmers. And farmers who earn more, have a lot of money, have a low probability of bankruptcy. We'll give them a zero, category zero. Farmers who doesn't earn much have a higher probability of bankruptcy. So we'll give them a one. And the beauty of logistic regression is that it can handle both categorical and numerical variables at the same time and model the probability of bankruptcy for every particular category. For instance, farmers who have a lot of animals has a lower probability of bankruptcy than farmers who have not so many animals. And if we go to the um, numeric variable, um, this is even more interesting that uh, farmers with a high IQ have a higher probability of bankruptcy than farmers with a low IQ. It sounds strange and counterintuitive in the first run, but if you think about it, how many not so smart people would st uh, start business? I don't think many. And people who are uh, smarter, they start more businesses, they uh, take more risks, and maybe that's why they fail more. I don't know. But it's interesting that we can see it um, from the data and we can discuss it in our foundings uh, and in our paper. This slide is probably the most important from the whole lecture because here we summarize everything we've learned so far. So the main idea of this introductory lecture is to um, show you the data and teach you how to see patterns or recognize patterns in this data. Particularly, if you see a column with two th things in it, um, you think about the exact binomial test. If you see a column with more than two things in it, more than two uh, categories, you think about the chi-square goodness of fit test. If you want to check whether two categorical variables um, have any association between each other, you think about the chi-square test, a simple and usual Pearson's chi-square test. If you want to check whether one numeric variable is dependent on the other, you use either correlation or simple linear regression. For more than one variable, you use a simple or multiple linear regression um, in order to check the salary and the factors which influence the salary. If your salary is not really good as a data, you can transform this data into the probability of bankruptcy, where low salary means high probability of bankruptcy, one, and high salary means low probability of bankruptcy, zero. And having zeros and ones on the two category, you can do logistic regression, which also can check the influence of these different factors on the probability of bankruptcy. So you see, having only two important uh, methods in your statistical toolbox, multiple linear regression and multiple logistic regression, can solve 95% of your statistical questions. 
Here is just the same what I just explained in words for you if you want to check this later. And the last thing I want to say is don't judge your statistical abilities too hard. There are two things which make statistics complicated. The terminology, which can be confusing, and mathematics, which you actually don't need because we have uh, calculators, we have computers uh, which do the work. So remember, statistics is not a big deal. The last thing uh, I want to present to you is p-hacking. It's very important because um, it can make the research good or bad. And the example of good research is to theorize some effect you want to study, collect the data, test that effect, and see if the p-value is small. If the p-value is small, you can publish it and be really confident about your findings. But if the uh, data is first collected without um, a purpose, but with general idea, then you have a lot of variables you can check. And then you test many of these different effects. And of course, you find something what is significant, and you publish these uh, significant fi findings as um, the thing you originally wanted to publish. And the good research is good because. Um, if we test one effect and found a small p-value, there is a very low chance that the sample is bad or quite extreme, which means there is a very low probability that our results came about by chance. However, if you test 20 different effects, um, this provides 20 opportunities to get a bad sample. And thus, um, it becomes statistically almost guaranteed that at least one of these 20 effects will be extreme or significant. Such low p-values are not real, but due to bad luck, please be aware of it. So, the last sentence is, if stats seems impossible to grasp, remember, you don't need to understand how the car works, you just need to know how to drive.